the giant and the Spaniard desperately tried to wake up their companion. And when finally the man in black, who had been mostly dead for most of the day, regained consciousness, he had a lot of questions. Where are we? Who are you? Are we friends? Are we enemies? Where's Buttercup? The Spaniard calmed him down and and responded by saying, let me explain. No, no, there's too much. Let me sum up. And with those words, Inigo Montoya uh, began to sum up why he and Fezzik had Wesley on the wall of Prince Humperdinck's castle and what their plan was to rescue Princess Buttercup. Now, most of you already know I'm talking about the Princess Bride, and you're wondering, are we talking about the Princess Bride this morning? I didn't know that was a Bible story. It's not, and we're not, but I really like that one line. To, to, I'll explain. No, there's too much. Let me sum up. Because I need to start this morning by explaining to you what we talked about last week. But there's really too much, so let me sum up. Uh, last Sunday, if you were here, you know we got to the end, and I said, that's it. This is to be continued. We have to come back to this next week. And so today we're, we're continuing. But if you weren't here, I do want to sum up what we talked about. So here it is in a nutshell. We're in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And, and this is kind of the second part of Ephesians. In the first part, uh, Paul tells us all about what God has done for us. How in the, the richness of his mercy and love and grace and kindness, he has rescued us and made us one with Christ and adopted us as his children. And therefore, because he's done so much for us, Paul says our lives ought to be worthy of what he has done. And so then Ephesians 4 through 6 is all about what it looks like for us to live a worthy life. And here in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, Paul is calling on us to be spiritually mature, to grow up, to look more like Jesus. And he tells us that God has empowered us to do that by giving each of us gifts. And so this week, we're going to drill down into Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, and specifically talk about these gifts that God has given to us, and how it is that these gifts empower us to be mature, to look like Jesus. So let me start by taking you back to a diagram I showed you last week about maturity, just to kind of remind you of where we were. Uh, We talked about this idea that maturity really plays itself out in relationships, When I'm very young, an infant or a child, I depend on everyone else. I don't take care of myself. Uh, Others are caring for me. And this is really the lowest level of maturity. But as I grow and mature, eventually I get married, and now I'm in this relationship where we're caring for each other. This is a whole new level of maturity. But beyond that, as I continue to grow, I, I reach this place where we're now parenting, and now no longer is there any focus on myself. But now I am completely focused on others along with my partner. And so together, we care for others. And really, this is the highest level of maturity. When I'm no longer focused on myself, my own needs, my own desires, but I'm focused on how I can meet the needs of others. A mature father changes his baby's diapers. There's nothing in that for the father. There's nothing in it for you if you change diapers. Diapers stink and they're messy and it's an awful task. But you do it because you love your children and because you love your wife. And you don't want her to have to change the diaper. And that's maturity. Maturity is when I take my focus off of myself and put it on to others. And so Paul is saying to us in Ephesians 4, you need to be mature. And that means focus less on yourself and more on others. So let's dig into this passage a little bit and see what Paul has to say about how this maturity in relationships empowers us to be who God created us to be. I'm going to start in Ephesians 4, verse 4. Paul writes, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So so the obvious key word here is one. Because Paul is directing our attention to this concept of unity. We are united around what we share. We all worship the same God. We share the same faith. We've been baptized into the same religion. And you could go on and on with all of the the ones that unite us. But then when Paul gets to verse 7, you see he says, but grace was given to each one of us. And, And so we've gone from one to many. 
from all of us being a collective group to each of us being individuals. And to us as individuals, Paul says, God's given all of us different gifts. And so there's this concept of unity, but Paul wants to make sure that we understand that unity is not unison. You know what unison is? Unison is when everybody sings the same words and the same notes all together. Everybody's exactly the same. And sometimes in Christianity, in other world religions, and in some churches, there's this idea that everybody has to be exactly the same. And there's no room for any differences. And so if you have a different idea, or if you act a little bit differently, or you're coming from a different place, then this isn't the place for you because we all want to be exactly the same. But that's not God's intent. That's not God's plan. God does not want us to all be exactly the same. In fact, he designed us to be different. And so what Paul is saying here is actually unity is not unison, and diversity develops unity. It's these gifts that God gave us that make us all different that enables us to build unity. And so when we look at each other and recognize that, hey, we're all a little bit different, we're all a little bit unique, that shouldn't drive us apart, it should drive us together. I think one of the places that we can see this principle played out most clearly is in politics. Now, I know, we're not supposed to talk about politics in church, right? Well, today we are, all right? Isn't this exciting? Some of you are like, oh, what's what's he going to say? So my observation is that over the past decade or so, in our country, uh, political discourse has really gone down a bad road. It's very difficult anymore to talk to anybody about politics, especially if you might disagree with them. Uh, Whether you're doing it in person or online, maybe you've had a conversation that's looked like this. You've been talking to someone, and you say, hey, you know, we've got a lot in common, and and I agree with you on some things. I, you know, I agree with you on the economy, and I agree with you on national security, but I, I, I think I see immigration a little bit different than you. And they respond by saying, well, you are just a hate-filled, discriminatory, alt-right wing nut, and I want nothing to do with you. And you're kind of left saying, whoa, what happened there? Or maybe, maybe the conversation goes like this. You say, hey, you know, we've got a lot of ideas that are the same here. You know, I think we're thinking the same stuff on education, and I absolutely agree with what you're saying about the military, but, you know, I, I might do health care a little bit differently than you. And, and the response is, well, you wacko, pinko, commie, leftist snowflake, get out of my sight. And, and I see these conversations, and, and I think to myself, wait a minute here. We, we actually agree on most things. And this, this is my observation, is that in, in our country's politics, 90 to 95% of us agree on most of what we value. We want to, to feel safe. We want to know that there's enough for our families, and we want to know that our neighbors have enough for their families. We want to live in a place where families are healthy. We want to live in a place where someone is rewarded for working hard, and we all want that, but we have different ideas about how that can be accomplished. And and the truth is that almost all of us agree on what the problems are, right? We we all would say, yeah, poverty is a problem, And, and drugs are a problem, And homelessness is a problem. We would all say, yeah, we pretty much agree on what the problems are, but we have different ideas about how to solve them. And so because we have these minor disagreements, we allow them to turn into these major divisions. And because we can't agree on the details, we get involved in this incredibly divisive debate. And it's not helpful for anyone, and nothing gets solved, and we just find ourselves further and further apart. That is not what God wants for his church. And so in God's church, it's so important for us to recognize that we're all different. We all come from different places. We all have different ideas. And that's okay. God created us differently. We all look differently. We sound different. We smell different. We have different ideas. We vote differently. We come from different places. We come from different backgrounds. We have some different ideas even on religious matters, and that's okay. Because God created us to be this amazing, 
diversity of people. And when Paul writes that God gave gifts to each of us, what he's saying is that God wants our differences to bring us together. And so his, his idea of the church, God's idea of the church, is that we are a place where we open our arms to what makes us different. And we hold tightly to what makes us the same. Because there are some things that we share. And those are the most important things. We can all agree that God is love. That the Bible is trustworthy. That nobody's perfect. That only Jesus saves us and that we all ought to love the world. We can agree on that. And that's what we hold tightly to because that's what unifies us. Paul says you've all been given different gifts. And you're all unique. And that is God's plan. But let's, let's dig in a little bit more to what these gifts are. We'll continue reading in verse 8. Paul writes, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? And he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now there's a lot of words here. Let me explain what what Paul is doing. He's painting a picture for us. So you have to go back in time to understand this, back to the time when Paul is writing, and even further back. And and envision this walled city that's under siege by a king. And eventually the king wins the battle and takes control of the city. What that king would do is he would march his army into the city. And the city that had surrendered to him, they would now be his captives. And he would march to the highest point in the city, where probably the throne room of the city was. And he would take his place on that throne, and everyone he had conquered, all of these people who are now his captives, they would be there, and they would have to give gifts to the king to show to him that they were going to be loyal. This is the picture that Paul is painting. And so we have this picture of a king who's conquered the city, receiving gifts, but Paul changes the picture just a little bit, doesn't he? Look look at what he says. He says, he gave gifts to men. So so the king is actually giving the gifts. So the conquering king has changed the equation just a little bit. So we have to ask ourselves the question, who is this king who, instead of receiving gifts from those he's conquered, gives gifts? And who then are these captives? And Paul actually explains that to us in this parenthetical statement When he said, in saying he ascended, what am I saying other than that he descended? See, he's talking here about Jesus. Because it was Jesus that descended down into the grave. It was Jesus that died so that he could descend into death to set free those who were captives to death. And that's us. You see, because of our sin, we're dead. We're spiritually dead, separated from God. And the reason Jesus died was to set us free from that captivity. And so at the cross, Jesus gave his own life and descended into the grave to set free those who were captives of the grave. And so now this is the picture. Is Paul saying, and so now the conquering king, Jesus, is marching to his throne and behind him is this great train of captives. Not that he has conquered, but that he has rescued And so when he sits on his throne, and now he's surrounded by all of these rescued captives, he gives gifts to them. This is what Paul is saying. Anyone who has been rescued by Jesus has also been given gifts by Jesus. That's you. So how is it it that I get rescued by Jesus? It's so simple. You just give your life to him. You see, at some point you've come to this place where you recognize that the way that you've been living doesn't work. Your sins, your mistakes, the times you've messed up, it's separated you from God, it's separated you from the people around you, and now you're willing to give up that old life, and so you give your new life to Jesus, and in return, he gives you his perfect life, and now you've been rescued from captivity, and you've been given a new life, and you've been given gifts. And maybe when you hear this, you're you're thinking to yourself, David, that sounds great, but I'm not so sure that I've been given gifts. 
So let me, let me take a little bit of time this morning and, and talk to you about the gifts that God has given you. Because he gave all of us gifts. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about five gifts that he gives every single one of us. Um, I actually preached a whole sermon on these five gifts back in January. And if you have the Version app, there's a link if you want to go back and get more depth on these. Because I'm going to kind of race through them this morning. Uh, or you can go to our church website, go back to January archives, and you can see it. But let me talk about the five gifts that Jesus has given every single one of us. The first gift is he's given all of us power. We're all good at something. Uh, we're not all good at the same things, but everybody's good at something. That's kind of what Chris was talking about uh, when he went to Haiti. He knew what he was good at. He's good at fixing things. And he finds himself in this place where there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be fixed. And so he's got this wonderful power that's been given to him by God that he can fix things and he can use that to do the work of God. And every single one of us has power. Every single one of us has stuff that we are good at. And we can use what we're good at for the good of the world around us. Every single one of us has been given passion. We feel strongly about, about different things. We love to do uh, different things. Some of you love to cook. Uh, some of you love to fix stuff. Some of you love to just sit and have coffee with other people. And all of those pursuits that you love to do can be used to bring glory to God. They can be used to impact others with the love of God. If you're willing to take what you are passionate about and use it to do God's work, it's a gift from God. Your passions, what you love, that's God's gift to you. You have a personality. It's another one of God's gifts. And all of our personalities are different, right? Some of us are extroverted. Some of us are introverted. Some of us are adventurous. Some of us are cautious. But all of us have a personality that's been given by God. One of, one of the things I love that we do here is our prayer time. Every Sunday, we have somebody different get up and pray. And on display during our prayer time is all of the different personalities that God has given our church. Right? Sometimes we have somebody who gets up and they, they pray this stirring, loud prayer. And sometimes it's a very soft and quiet and reflective prayer. And, and I sit and I listen to all of you pray. And I just thank God for making us all so different. And giving us all these different personalities that contribute to our unity. Whatever your personality is, God gave it to you for a purpose. And he wants you to use it for his, his kingdom. God's also given you possessions. Your house, your car, your toys, your dogs, even your cats. Everything you have is a gift from God. How would it change your life? If you started looking at all of your stuff, all of your possessions, and asking yourself, how can I use this for God's work? How can I use this to show God's love to others? How can I use my house? How can I use my car? How can I use my crock pot to show God's love? Everything we have is a gift from God. And the last gift that he's given to all of us is our past. And I know when I say that, some of you think, David, wait a minute, my past is not a gift from God. You don't know my past. It is dark. It is awful. I've been in some bad places. And I want you to hear me this morning that wherever you have been, God can redeem that. You know, when someone comes to me and they're going through an exceptionally difficult time, maybe they've lost a loved one, my past doesn't help me with that. But I can point them to someone else who's experienced the very same thing and say, let me, let me have you talk to this person. Because they know what you're talking about. And they've experienced the same past as you. And God has redeemed it for them. And let me set you up with them so that you can connect and they can speak truth and love into your life. You see, when we give our past to God, whether it's a past that's full of success or failure, full of good times or bad times, full of pleasure or pain, whatever your past is, when you give it to God and allow Him to redeem it, He can use it through you to accomplish good things. Your past is a gift from God. And all of these gifts that God has given us, our power, our passion, our personality, our possessions, our past, all of these gifts empower us and enable us to be mature. Because when we use these gifts to focus on others, for the good of others, to meet the needs of others, then we are growing to look like Jesus. You think about Jesus. What did he have? He had everything. He was all-powerful. He was all-knowing. He was all-present. He was everything. And he took everything that he had and gave it up for us. And then he says we're to be like him. 
So he wants us to use all of the gifts that God has given us so that we can look like Jesus for the good of other people. Let's keep going. Verse 11, Paul writes, and. Now, this is actually a really important word here. Because we need to understand that what Paul is about to say, he's actually adding on to what he just said. All right? So he just said, if you've been rescued by Jesus, then you've been gifted by Jesus. And so everybody has gifts. And in addition to that, he says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And and so now here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, now, now, there's, there's a couple of other gifts I, I need you to know about. These aren't the only gifts. These aren't all the gifts. This is just a category of gifts that's important for this discussion. He says some people have gifts of, of an apostle, which means they're, they're good at organizing and, and putting things together. Some have the gifts of prophets, which means they're wise, they're discerning, they, they speak truth into people's lives. Some have the gift of an evangelist, which means they're just always outwardly focused, always thinking about other people, always about outreach. Some people have the gift of shepherding, which is they're good at caring for people and discipling people, helping them to look more like Jesus. And some people have the gift of teaching, which is communicating. Now, now when you look at these, group, these, these gifts, these are what we might think of as the more public gifts or the, the leadership gifts. And what Paul is saying, he's saying, There are some people who have been given specific gifts so that they can equip the church to do God's work. That's that's what he says here. These gifts, these five gift sets, are what? To equip the saints, to make it possible for the saints, that's all of us, to do the work of ministry. And and so what what Paul is getting at here is there's a formula that, that God desires leaders to equip the church to do the work of God. That's that's what Paul is saying. He's saying leaders equip the church to do God's work. That means that that those of us who have been given gifts of of leadership, uh, we should be using those gifts to equip everyone else. I like that word equip because it doesn't say mandate or force or demand, right? It It doesn't say be the boss. It says you equip, you empower, you build into people's lives so that they can use their gifts to do God's work. But, but sometimes we get it wrong. Uh, sometimes in churches, we get it a little bit backwards, and we think the way it works is that the church equips the leaders to do God's work. And here's what that looks like. Everybody comes to church on Sunday, and as we leave, we put our money in the offering box, and we say, I'm paying, and, and I'm putting this money in here so all those people who are in charge, they can do the work of God. And then Monday through Saturday, I'm going to go do my thing and trust that they're doing their thing. I'm going to come back on Sunday. They're going to sing for me. They're going to talk to me. And they're going to take care of my kids. Then I'm going to leave and and be good to go. So I give my money, and that equips them and so that they can do the ministry. That's not God's plan. God's desire is that he gives some people gifts of leadership so that they can pour themselves into everyone so that everyone can use their gifts to do God's work. Now, Now, we take that really seriously here at the gathering. Uh, Over the past several months, uh, it's been exciting to watch as our church has been in in another growth spurt. That means lots more people coming in. And and when more people come in, that means more gifts are coming in. And and we got to talk about what it looks like for us to help these people use their gifts to do God's work. And so we've been having these conversations in different leadership meetings uh, with the board and with the staff to ask the question, how do we readjust? How do we realign so that we can better equip God's people to do God's work in God's world. And I'm really excited because there's some very specific uh, changes we're going to make uh, in our leadership structure to help us do a better job of investing in you, of empowering you, unleashing you to do the work that God has gifted you to do. Because we need everybody on board. You know, the body doesn't work if all the parts aren't working. When I was in high school, I played basketball, and I know that doesn't make sense to you because I'm really short, but in high school, you can get away with it. But I played basketball in high school, and in my senior year, uh, third game of the season, I broke my toe. 
I was really disappointed because my senior year is my last chance to play. And, and I broke my big toe, and the doctor said, you're out for six weeks. I said, doctor, it's my toe. It's like this big. I don't need it. Look, I'll just go play basketball. He said, well, if you want to try, go ahead. You know what I discovered? The big toe is really important in basketball. Because you use your big toe when you do stuff like walk <laughs> and run and jump and land and, and turn and, and all these things that are really important. And, and I had to wear this, this wooden shoe thing for six weeks all because my toe didn't work. And, and I want you to hear that, that God's body is the same. Sometimes, sometimes we think, you know, my gift is really small. I'm just the toe. I'm not important. But you know, when, when the toe isn't contributing, the whole body is limping. And the whole body is slow. And the body can't reach its potential unless it has the big toe. And so if you're sitting here this morning and thinking, well, you know, I know God's given me some gifts, but I'm, I'm kind of like a toe. We need you. We need you to be the toe. So that we can get where God wants us to get and we can do what God has called us to do. So, so let me make this really practical for us this morning. All right, Let me make it really practical. If you can open your program, in your program there's an insert. And on one side there's a picture of Jesus and two little kids. All right, And that's to remind us that maturity is when we look like Jesus. And what I want you to do is take a minute and look at this insert and ask yourself the question, is there anything here that catches my eye? that maybe meets up with my power or my passion or my personality or my possessions or my past. And maybe there's a place here where I can use my gift to kind of be part of the body, to, to invest in the body, to help us all grow to be more mature. And what I want to challenge you to do, if you're not already serving somewhere in the church, I want to challenge you to take a test drive. You wouldn't buy a car without test driving at first. And I'm not going to ask you to commit to something without test driving at first. And so take a test drive. Uh, check one of the boxes or two of the boxes or all of the boxes, whichever one looks like maybe they fit with the gifts that God has given you. And somebody's going to get in touch with you and say, hey, here's what we do and, and here's some of the, the positions we need to fill. And would you be interested in just trying it out? You're not going to be asked to commit for a long term. Just, hey, try it once or twice. See if it fits. Give it a test drive. If you're thinking, boy, that's a little too much commitment for me. I'm not quite ready for that step. Uh, maybe the step you're looking for is to get connected with other people. And I just need to make some friends here. I need to know some more people. You know, the best place for you to do that is in a life group. So if you flip that insert over to the other side, that's the life group side, the connection side. And if you just want to start meeting people, get connected with people, uh, be in a group that gets together and enjoys fellowship with one another, uh, look at the boxes, check the ones that work for you, put your name and contact info, and somebody's going to contact you this week and help you get connected. Now, I know many of you are in this process right now because our groups are starting to get going for the fall, and we're already connecting a lot of people, and I'm excited about that. We're starting some new groups. This is a great time to jump into a life group uh, right now. Now, some of you are hearing this and saying, yeah, I can do that. And some of you are saying, I'm not ready for this. This is way too much. I need a baby step. And that's cool because we're all about baby steps here. Uh, we believe that we get through life just by taking one step at a time. And if you need to take a baby step, then take a baby step. So let me give you some steps that anybody can take. If you want to try to serve using your gifts, but in a really, really easy way, sign up for the fall festival. September 22nd, uh, we give this great gift to our community. And we need a lot of people who are willing to just come out and, and give us a couple hours uh, maybe giving candy to kids or face painting or watching a bounce house or bringing water to people, whatever it is, there's a lot of different jobs you can do. Stop in the lobby as you're leaving today. Look at the big charts that are out there. Find a place that works for you and put your name in and say, this is where I can volunteer. That's a nice, simple baby step where you can start to use the gifts God's given you to serve other people. That's spiritual maturity. Maybe you're looking for a baby step just to get connected, just to meet some more people. In two weeks, September 9th, we have Sunday night at the barn. And this is a great event. Sunday night at 7 o'clock, we'll meet out at the barn on the back of our property. Our band is going to be playing music for us the whole time. And, 
And we'll have a bonfire. We'll have s'mores and snacks. And it's, it's really informal, a great place to just show up and meet people. Uh, Have some conversations, get to know some other people. It's a tiny little baby step you can take to begin investing in other people. Begin growing into spiritual maturity. You know, last week, we got to the end of the sermon, I said, so, to be continued. Uh, We're going to have to stop here and go on. But I'm not going to do that this week because now we're finally to the end of Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And, And so this isn't to be continued this week. This week it's, that's the end. Except... I want it to be the beginning for you. I want this to be the beginning of a journey towards spiritual maturity, a journey where you are learning how you can invest yourself, the gifts God has given you, into the people around you. And and so I hope that this week you'll find a way to do that. Find a way to take what God has given you and pour that into the lives of other people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all of your gifts. And thank you for bringing all of us together and uh, the uniqueness of each person and the contributions of the the diversity that is here. And we pray that the gathering will always be a place uh, where we can share the big things and embrace the small things. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was willing to descend into death to set us free and to give us gifts. Help us to be people who embrace the gifts you've given us and use them for your work in your kingdom. In your name, amen.